Hi guys, um, Theo, thanks a lot, and thanks to ISPA for hosting me. Um, I'm talking about going global and the challenges of scaling, and I'd just like to also just say that um, I don't think a Dynamo is quite where we want yet. I wouldn't consider us a global success, but we've definitely learned a lot of lessons, and those are the lessons that I want to share with you today. <coughs> also, maybe just to mention, I think a lot of people associate online advertising as the, we, we're the Satan of the internet, and <laughs> we bring you all, the, all those ads that we love to hate. But um, I think that it is um, a fundamental part of the internet ecosystem. I think that without advertising, we don't get access to all the free content that we love to read. And, um, but I do believe that there's balance required, and our best publishers that, that we use um, sometimes have one ad on, 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 a, on a web page that goes five times off the screen. So our philosophy very much is less is more, and uh, you know, I think we're quite sensitive to the user experience, and we don't dream of a utopia with five million banner ads per page. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so just briefly about a Dynamo. We're a direct competitor to Google AdSense um, or the Google Content Network. We're a fully automated contextual advertising marketplace that seamlessly connects publishers to advertisers. Uh, we're a globally competitive ad network. We trade in every market worldwide, and we are mobile and online. Just some of the publishers that use us, some of the advertisers that use us, and then just a brief history. We were founded in 2009, funded by Intelligence and Inventfin, and at the start of this year, we received our second round of funding to start globalizing the business. Um, we've launched into a number of markets, which I'll, I'll dive into in a few secs. Okay, no problem. So we've achieved 20% market share of Google's in the past 18 months in South Africa. To put that in perspective, um, that's 20% of Google's content network. Um, one third of Google's revenue is derived not from search, but from their content network. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty big um, slice of the pie for Google. I think it's um, quite often overlooked that Google's, um, that so much of their revenue comes from non-search based revenue. Um, we serve a billion ads a, m a month in 19 different languages worldwide. Um, and according to Effective Measures, which is the DMMA's uh, measurement partner in South Africa, we're pretty much hovering between the first and second uh, biggest channel for reaching an online audience in South Africa. So we're quite happy. I mean, I think that's quite a, a, rapid, um, a rap rapid rise to you know, a significant share of South Africa's markets. I've also just got a few stats from my techies that I thought, since it is ISPA, um, I thought I'd mention. We spider an index about uh, 10 gigs of data per day. To put that in context, it's 10 gigs of the actual content of a site, so no images, style sheets, just the raw text from a website, so it's quite a lot of data. Um, we consume six terabytes of um, bandwidth per month, which I don't know if that's a lot for you, but maybe <laughs> for us it seems a lot. Um, and we average a, th a, thousand, um, a thousand processes per second um, at any one time on our servers. We currently have 19,000 publishers working with us, um, ranging from large publishers to niche blogs. Um, we're acquiring more than 100 publishers a day, so we're pr pretty much uh, growing by about, um, you know, by more than 1,000 a month at the moment, so it's ramping up quite quickly. We're the fastest paying ad network in the world. I know maybe none of this is that relevant to you, but I wanted to just paint a bit of a picture to, so I can present some of our challenges in scaling globally. Um, most ad networks that have tried to compete with Google have had a bad rep quite quickly by um, winning a lot of support. People love an alternative to the big bad monster, and then they don't get paid. <laughs> so um, for us, you know, it's mission critical to, um, to pay quickly and on the first day of every month uh, with a significantly lower threshold than our arch rival. Um, but to do that on a global scale has, has its challenges. And to some extent, I would say that um, you know, we like to think our technology is pretty sophisticated, but I'd say that the most sophisticated part of our business is actually the, the way we handle money and the financial, the financial backbone, which being you know, techies and ex-web guys is totally out of our comfort zone. <laughs> 
Um, just briefly, I won't go into this, but this is just some of the market research that we did when we started selecting some of our markets. Um, where we ranked, we took, uh, we took China and the US out just because they distort the numbers a little bit. And we ranked markets by internet users versus uh, GDP per capita to come up with our own ranking system of the value per, for each market. The ones in orange represent markets where there were specific opportunities available to us. Um, we're quite proud of our reporting. <laughs> So just looking at the countries where we are right now, we have offices in Ireland, in the UK, in Spain, Netherlands, um, Nigeria, which comes with its own set of challenges, um, and obviously South Africa. Um, and I'll say that you know, South Africa is very much, you know, one of the challenges for us has been to pursue growth, but also to um, not ignore our roots and forget um, a very important market to us and forget that we are a South African company ultimately. Um, other markets that we're heading into include, uh, some of them aren't on there, but uh, Brazil, Poland, Turkey, Australia. Um, so quite an um, ambitious growth plan over the next year. So just going into a reality check. Um, first of all, you have to be in it to win it. You can't, um, you can't hope to enter the UK if you don't have a presence in the UK. Um, I would also say that um, having local people um, you know, to help you deal with the, the cultural divides and cultural issues is also critical. So being, the, being there on its own is not only sufficient, but um, integrating yourself with that market and with the people within that market that carry sway and, um, and whose uh, opinions people respect. We also learned the hard way that local's not so lacquer. When we started, we thought that everyone would flock to us because we were South African and we were gonna give Google a run for their money. And that didn't happen. Um, you know, we, we had to start the hard way, and we had to slowly but surely build a business that offered real value to advertisers and to publishers. Um, you know, publishers will use you for a short while. They love an alternative to Google, but if they're earning less than what they could earn with AdSense, ultimately, they will just switch back. And um, it makes complete sense. So, you know, our driving force, you know, we had to eventually realize that the only way to succeed would be to work towards a point where our publishers could earn more. Which, is, which was very ambitious at the time, but many of our publishers now earn three or four hundred percent more than what they did with AdSense. Um, and we've also learned the hard way that South Africa has a lot more in common with international, many international markets than the rest of Africa. And um, going to Nigeria has been very interesting. We were warned up front, just because you're South African, don't think you know anything about Africa, and we're like, yeah, whatever. Um, we also have power cuts, and <laughs> but over there, it's just the way of life. It's normal. It's, um, there's no one day with, you know, with power consistently. Um, many big businesses don't have landlines. They just, every person in the business just carries a business cell phone. And it's a strange way of operating, but um, that's how it is. And we found a lot more um, affinity to many international markets, even places like Poland. I consider, you know, I've, I found the culture in Poland uh, very similar to South Africa. Um, they're very tech strong, like South Africans, um, and they're, they're pretty uh, sophisticated audience. And there's a, yes, there's a little bit of a language barrier, but um, we have a lot more in common with them than many countries on our doorstep. Interesting points. Um, uh, communism, which was imposed on Poland twice after each world war by Russia, has been the reason for them being the fastest growing economy in Europe. Um, because it's made broadband accessible to every home, because everyone lives in group housing that was provided by the Russians. <laughs> so it's interesting, there are, some, there are some positives coming out of that. So just um, looking at sort of some of the challenges that face us with um, a typical click that would happen on a publisher's website. So a typical scenario, you have a publisher based in Kenya, um, who we would then pay in US dollars, you have an advertiser in Spain who will be paying us in euros, and the Spanish advertiser will be targeting an audience in the US, which happens to be browsing, um, which happens to be browsing the Kenyan website and places a click. Now that's a, I mean, obviously we have thousands of those happening uh, every hour, but that's a, you know, that's a typical transaction where we record the revenue versus, you know, in the US because that's, that's the place where the click took place but we have to pay someone in Kenya and we have to receive money from someone in, in Spain. And we broker all of that seamlessly. So just looking at some of the scaling uh, challenges that we've had, obviously tech has been a you know, major focus. Um, 
You know, we talk of ourselves as an advertising company, but ultimately we are a tech-driven company. Um, without, you know, continuing to innovate and advance, we, we did. Um, and, and I guess, you know, for us that's been a major challenge, and especially when you have um, things like shareholders who are very numbers-focused, um, the tech doesn't mean much to them. You know, they don't, you know, they can't quantify what it means to go to a next version or to improve your code. You know, they're looking at numbers and they're looking at revenue and the next market that you're opening up at. So for us, you know, scaling has been a challenge in um, obviously building an infrastructure that can scale. When we first started, we would win a big publisher and everything would fall over. <laughs> Um, and we, 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 we pass that now where we pretty much make sure that our system runs at um, no more than 20% capacity for the event that we do get a major publisher who wants to switch on overnight that we can handle that. Um, and also and then balancing the, you know, the, the, the scaling of your tech and you know, the, ha the management of growth with innovation that has to continue at the same time. Finance has been a big issue for us, um, and I just wanted to point out there have been a lot of, um, I've seen quite a lot of complaints about, you know, the Reserve Bank and so on, and our experience with the Reserve Bank has been incredibly positive. It's the South African banks that have let us down. Um, you know, for any business that wants to globalize and set up offshore companies, you have to file your application through the bank, um, you know, it represents you within the Reserve Bank. And um, our bank, unfortunately, didn't do that particularly well, and it cost us a year of, you know, w you know, we wanted to, to start globalizing the business much earlier. And they just told us it was impossible. And it got to the point where, I, you know, somehow our office secretary gave me a you know, she phoned the Reserve Bank, they gave her a name. I phoned the guy, asked me to drop him a mail, I wrote him two lines and they approved us. Um, you know, so that, you know, it's, it was fascinating to see, you know, we, I think we all have a perception of anything government related, a negative perception, and um, was quite refreshing to see how um, you know, how proactive the, the, you know, the Reserve Bank in particular is, and that's been great. But things, you know, in, in countries like Spain, you know, it's Europe, but wow, opening a bank account, you know, that took us four months. <laughs> um, you know, it's a tiny little basic things that we just take for granted, you know, um, you think you're going to arrive and open an office, and um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's just not like that. Um, credit card processing has been a major issue for us. Um, you know, 3D Secure is now you know, fundamental part of credit card processing online, and there are very few payment gateways worldwide that can, uh, most of them now support 3D Secure, but um, uh, we do recurring payments. So advertiser would register with us, we'll charge them uh, a, tw a 20 rand deposit, and then every time they spend 100 rand, we would debit their card again. Um, and there are very few payment gateways in the world that allow you to do a, th a recurring 3D Secure transaction. So that's another six months. Um, so, you know, that, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, pretty basic fundamental things that uh, take your focus away from the actual, you know, part of your business that really is what you're about is, you know, a, a real frustration, but you have to deal with it. And then people, I would say, you know, um, our biggest challenge has probably been, uh, you know, South Africa has great people, so we've continued to build most of our international capacity in Cape Town, but um, maintaining the DNA of your, of your business. And I would say that, um, you know, one of our ambitions has always been, you know, we want to, everyone wants to be big and successful, but um, to be big without being a typical corporate who, where customers get, you know, become numbers. Um, you know, we want to be, you know, we would like to one day be big with a small company culture. And that's very hard to do when a lot of you aren't in the same room. You know, a year ago we could all grab a beer after a hard day and we can't do that anymore. But, you know, maintaining the company DNA and what makes up that company and what makes you different to all your competitors is, um, has been a major focus for us as well. I think I've, you know, chatted about logistics and, and that's enough. But um, the one positive I take out of that is that, you know, all of these, all of these logistical challenges and all of these um, hiccups that slow down scaling and growth um, are there for your competitors as well. You know, anyone else who plans to do the same thing will have to go through the same pains as you. And we see that as a major, um, probably one of our biggest barriers to entry for competitors. Um, and there are competitors, there are lots of competitors in our market, but um, there are a lot of them that are still, there's some really big global guys that are still faxing around credit card details on pieces of paper worldwide, you know, it's, um, you know which is, you know, I don't think that's sustainable. Um, but I think that for me, that's the one big positive, you know, if, you know, in having gone through everything that it would have to be repeated by whoever else plans to do it as well. So just um, some, you know, in the foreign markets we've entered, um, you know, things that we have to deal with, language, culture, um, finance, 
and understanding in each market who the specific competitors are there, uh, making sure that we're globally aligned. Each country manager you know, wants to do their own thing and has their own view, and there's, a, I guess, a bit of balance between giving them leeway but also trying to um, retain a single identity worldwide. And then, you know, reward and, reward and incentive. You know, um, a, lot of our, a lot of our activity happens across multiple markets and how to reward, you know, um, for example, the guys in Spain are very focused on what happens in Spain, but, you know, they sign an advertiser that wants to target Belgium, you know, and, uh, you know, looking at ways of handling that as fairly as possible to keep everyone encouraged and aligned is um, quite a big challenge. On the cultural side, fascinating, uh, um, you know, we've, we've seen uh, a lot of American companies in Eastern Bloc countries, for example, there's a story of eBay. They entered Poland and withdrew after two weeks. Um, and what happened, with, what happened there is that um, they, they did a big launch in Fanfare, and they didn't translate the website properly. And um, everyone embraced them at first, and then as soon as they picked up that... Um, the website was, you know, badly translated. In some parts, were still English. Emails were still English. Um, th there was sort of a public revolt, and people felt that they were being accommodated, and that Poland wasn't important to them. And uh, we see a lot of that. You know, people are partisan. You know, and uh, they're passionate about their countries. In Australia, we get a lot of hate mail because we don't support the Aussie dollar yet. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, where we thought, you know, for most international markets, US dollar would cut it. And Australians are, you know, incredibly patriotic. And you know, for them, you know, you know, many of them choose not to use us, not because it's not even a question of if we offer them value or not. It's because we don't support the Aussie dollar. And they thought we were. They thought Australia was important to us, you know. So um, it's, it's it's amazing how people do react to things that we kind of are quite dismissive of. Some of the benefits we've had from globalization is that it smooths our revenue curve. And in South Africa, you know, we to some extent it's a terrible saying, but we get to look under the skirts and see what's really happening because we see the activity across so many publishers within our country, and we see usage patterns. 85% of, of all online browsing takes place during office hours on Monday to Friday. 85%, um, in fact, of all activity over a seven-day week takes place between eight to five. Uh, you know, on a typical, in South Africa, on a typical day, we make, we make about 70% of our revenue in three hours. Um, you know, so sort of from eight to nine, and then from sort of, you know, and, and then from three to, three to five in the afternoon again. Um, so you can still see how many people are dependent on work internet. Um, when we introduced mobile, it smoothed that out a little bit for South Africa because what's not happening online is then happening in mobile. And weekends are run at about 15% the level of a normal weekday. But when we introduced uh, international markets, we saw you know, our revenue smooth out quite nicely. Um, in markets like the Netherlands, it's fascinating. We see um, they, they slow rises. They only really start browsing at 10 in the morning. But it's just literally, you know, South Africa is a, a typical bell. The Netherlands is a straight line all the way up to 2 a.m. <laughs> you know, it just gets, the usage just gets higher and higher till 2 a.m. They all go to bed and they start at 10 again, every day. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, and obviously, unfortunately, there is a little bit of, a, you know, a credibility issue with, you know, we've, we've packaged ourselves, we, we're busy packaging London as our headquarters, but we have three people there. You know, it's, um, we have our real team in South Africa, and our real leadership is in South Africa. Um, but, you know, from a credibility perspective, you know, we have, you know, we have, um, we have had to, you know, put international customers at ease. Um, we've also found out since running our London office, a lot of, a lot of advertisers who we've called again, who, you know, who registered but never started advertising, their, their reason for not using us was because they saw a South African phone number on the website. We have a UK number too, but they saw a South African one as well, and that was uncomfortable for them. <laughs> So um, what we have seen, though, one big positive is that um, I think the mobile sector has really innovated, and South Africa's mobile is way, way ahead of many markets. And uh, many conferences and so on that we've been to internationally, um, the speakers and the companies that present use South Africa as a benchmark. Um, they say, you know, look, we're nearly as good as South Africa at this, and they and they talk about the mixits and mahalas, and um, and that's been quite refreshing. So what we have seen from a mobile perspective is that our our mobile our mobile offering is much easier to to sell in many cases because they assume that if we're South African, we know what we're doing. 
Um, and then also in our, and this is, uh, this is uh, applicable to us and I think maybe to many internet services companies, but we have seen that to be locally successful, you do have to be global. Because when we started with a specific focus of wanting to, to be successful in South Africa only, we had the challenge that, yes, private property, the bulk of their traffic, they one of our star publishers, by the way, but the bulk of their traffic is South African. But what about the 20% that's from people in the UK and the US looking for South African property? We couldn't monetize that. So, you're, you know, so we were always on a back foot against Google AdSense until we went international, where now we can monetize everything. And, you know, we have, you know, and unfortunately, you know, whether we had um, ambitions to globalize the business or not, we would have to have a, a worldwide view on the business in some way or form because many South African publishers have a large percentage of their, I think iAfrica has more traffic internationally than in South Africa. Uh, because it was one of the first internet websites that we all knew when the internet arrived and uh, many people that follow it are now, ex, you know, are now no longer living in South Africa and it's got a huge use, user base, but um, you, know, you, know, you can't, you, uh, in, our, in our sector we've just found that you can't, have a, you can't ring fence the internet with boundaries and um, you have to deal with that. Some of the lessons we've learned, um, we came up with a franchise model to cheapen, just make sure my time. Uh, we came up with a franchise model to cheapen the international expansion of the business, um, where, whereby we share some profit in territories and established partners help to set up shop for us there. And we've actually found that many markets where we just had perceptions of costs and so on are, are not more expensive than South Africa. Um, so places like Spain, you know, I, I regret having, you know, having signed up with a partner there. They're a great partner, but if I look at what they've invested and we're giving away half of our profits, it's, it's not an ideal situation. It's, um, you know, it's, it's the same, it's pretty much the cost is on par with running a, a three-man office in Cape Town. Um, you know, so many European countries, I think uh, England is um, a little bit of an exception, but many European company, uh, countries are pretty cheap to do business in. Um, so I guess, you know, that's been one lesson we've learned the hard way, that, um, that you, know, um, you know, salaries and so on are not so out of proportion to what's earned in South Africa. And in each new market, each new language, each new currency we take on slows down our innovation. And I think that's our biggest lesson. And um, there's nothing you can do about it, but something you just need to, to realize that when you decide to turn on that tap, everything goes backwards because um, a single form on your website, you know, it takes two days to roll out because you're waiting for 19 languages, you know, <laughs> to, of translations to, to deploy. You can't, ro you can't roll out, you can't roll it out halfway, you know, so, you know, uh, really basic functionality has become, you know, a, lo a, a lot more challenging to deploy and, um, and, and that's, that's a big frustration for us who, you know, we've, we've got a, 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 I guess, a Jack Russell personality. We've always been small and nimble and we could always adapt and, you know, we could write something at home at night and roll it out that morning without even telling anyone, you know, because you thought it would make the, make the experience better and those days are gone. <laughs> um, I've mentioned Africa and the fact that we, we, we've learned that Africa is really tough. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's still quite a lot of, everyone also talks about mobile in Africa and there's a lot of hype. And ironically, I mean, if you look at the mo our mobile competitors in Africa, um, guys like Inmobi and Buzz City, they, their success is coming from their own content that they serve their own ads onto. They own their biggest publisher uh, because there are no good mobile publishers in Africa, um, or they're very few. And um, we literally have um, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table from a single agency in London right now targeting mobile in Africa, and we can't, we can't seal the deal because we have nowhere to place the ads. Um, so that's been, you know, uh, you know Africa, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of hype about mobile, but I think the, the quality of content and the publishing still needs to catch up. For us, a big lesson has been to celebrate the little things. You know, the frustrations we went through in South Africa, we, we going through in each new market again, and it can be very frustrating, winning three customers, losing two, sometimes three, <laughs> and then having to win one back, um, you know, and going through those same pains all over again. And I think for us, the only thing that's kept us sane is celebrating the small things. Um, you know, going for a beer when you sign something for 100 bucks. You know what, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all progress, and it helps to get you to where you want to be. And we've also learned to adapt and uh, sometimes to you know, throw away the rule book uh, whilst keeping our eye on the big picture and the strategy, but we have had to, you know, sometimes we'll see activity in our system and a market will become more important when 
You know, in many markets, we'll arrive and we'll struggle to, without publishers, we have nothing to sell to advertisers. And in some markets, you'll suddenly find, wow, I've got Egypt. I'm serving, Egypt is one of those, by the way. We're serving a million ads a day. We haven't even, we, we know nothing about Egypt, you know, except the pyramids, you know, and um, the fact that they like a lot of porn, by the way. Um, it's, um, <laughs> the, it, almost every Egyptian, we, we're a non-adult, we have no adult content on our site, so it's quite frustrating. We turn a lot of uh, people away. But it's, I mean, I think it's a classic example of an of a overly regulated society finding some way to express themselves. <laughs> so I just wanted to try to pull it back, um, besides looking at scaling and so on, I wanted to pull it back to some of the, the social impacts of online advertising. And I think you know, one of the big things is, um, is that it's a source of, you know, online advertising presents a source of, any, of income to anyone in the world. You know, we have uh, people in Kenya and Nigeria, you know, earning a, earning a livelihood out of placing ads on their blog, and they've built up a user base. And you know what? You don't have to build up a readership in your market. You can target uh, a U.S. audience or a U.K. audience. Um, our biggest rugby website that we serve ads on, which is focused on Super 15, is run by a British guy. And he's ob obviously a rugby fan. I think in, you know, with a little bit of um, you know, you know, thought, he realized that there would be far bigger readership of following the Super 15 than following the league in, in the UK. Um, so we're actually launching a, a debit card um, in, in a few weeks from now, a, v a fully functional Visa debit card that we'll post to our publishers anywhere in the world because of the challenges we have in paying people in Pakistan on time. And basically, we'll top the card up on the first day of every month with whatever they earned. So, you know, I think that, you know, it really has become a, um, a source of income that's got no boundaries. You can, you can earn money from someone who was, you know, in the U.S. browsing your site that you host in Nigeria. And for me, that's quite exciting. It's uh, very empowering. And then also, ads, as we know, facilitate access, free access to content. And I think, you know, everyone always complains about advertising and they con uh, complain about paywalls to quality content. And the reality facing us is that it has to be one or the other. You have to be prepared to pay to enter um, the financial mail, or you have to be prepared to watch ads. But you can't have good content without ads because those journalists need to make a living as well. And that's it, guys. Uh, operational where? International. The bank. Um, well, we've had, to use, we've had to use a number of banks. Um, in most countries, you have to, well, like South Africa, you have to have an entity. You know, so you have to have a company in each country that you hope to operate. So that's, but um, in Nigeria has been quite refreshing in that we've actually discovered Standard Bank can give you a bank account without having to have a company there, which you really don't want. Um, their, tax, their tax system, for example, is very much you meet with the tax man and you negotiate what you think you should pay that year. Um, <laughs> It's, it's like big companies are still rolling like that, you know, um, companies that are paying like $100 million a year of tax go in and they negotiate behind closed doors. Um, so you don't want to own, as, well, from our perspective, we don't want to own something there. But in the UK, we've, uh, uh, we've actually used um, HSBC, which is not a great bank, but they work with SagePay, which is a phenomenal payment gateway. And SagePay supports uh, credit card processing in any currency. Um, and they've been, they've been fantastic. So um, th that's, you know, that's how we've done the UK, and we process most of our international currencies through that hub. <laughs>